Hello, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. Today, we are talking with Museum of Science educators from the Live Animal Center about pandemic babies. My name is Sarah, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be keeping an eye out for all of your questions today. Thank you for those of you turning in on Facebook or YouTube, but please note that we are not able to share your comments with our educators. For everyone who are here on Zoom, just press the Q&A button to ask your questions. If you'd like a shout out, don't forget to leave your name and age. If you'd like to see captions, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show captions. So now I would like to invite my first educator and animal friend to introduce themselves and we'll get started. Everyone, my name is Corey. I am the invertebrate keeper here at the Museum of Science. And with me today is Liz, our assistant curator of the Live Animal Center. So today we are talking about pandemic babies. So we wanted to share with all of you guys some of the animals that were born here at the museum while we've been either shut down or, you know, working in our quarantine state. So I'm going to have Liz turn on our first guy. So the first animals we're going to be seeing are really, really tiny. So we hope that the autofocus kind of focuses in on them for you guys. So we're going to be talking about our beetles. So at the museum, if you've watched before, you've probably heard me mention that we have lots of babies up in the butter, uh, up in our, in our insect zoo all the time. So I decided to pick some of our newest guys. So this uh, beetle larva that you're looking at right here is called a water tiger. And this guy, when he grows up, will become a sunburst diving beetle. So it's a little aquatic beetle. So uh, this guy is two days old. So just came out of his egg a couple days ago. And what makes them so cool is that they are one of the only animals on the entire planet that have bifocal vision. So that means they are able to see close up and far away at the exact same time. Our eyes as humans, we think we can do that, but our eyes as humans, we first focus on whatever we're looking at. So we can't look close and far away at the same time. Our eyes are focusing on one or the other. So right now he's a little hard to see, but our little water tiger is up at the surface of the water and is breathing through the end of his abdomen. So the end of his body is how they breathe. These guys are vicious carnivores. So even though he's just the size, he's even smaller than my pinky nail, these guys will eat uh, small fish, they'll eat tadpoles, and they, but their favorite is mosquito larva. So baby mosquitoes are their favorite. So as you can imagine, they're super important for our ecosystems because they're eating all of that baby, all those uh, baby mosquitoes. So right now, uh, our water tigers, we have this one and one other one up in the butterfly garden. Usually we have, uh, depending on the type of year, we can have anywhere from two to 60. And then what we're doing is we're actually sending these guys out to other institutions so that these animals aren't collected in the wild. So we're going to switch gears and go to our next baby. And then we're going to take questions because this is also another beetle baby. So this is a grub. So beetle larva is called grubs. Um, so right now Liz is giving you a nice little view of our very dirty grub. So these guys, um, similar to butterflies, all beetles go through complete metamorphosis. So they start as an egg, then they be turn into a larva or a grub, then they uh, pupate, so they make a little case that they uh, transform into a beetle inside and then they come out as their adult beetle. So this grub right here is a Derby's flower beetle. So once this one is an adult, it will be a huge green beetle, which is really cool. So the difference between our two larvae that we've seen so far is one's aquatic and one stays on land. What makes our land guy really cool is that uh, these beetles have six legs and we're going to see if Liz wants to flip them over and kind of show you. I don't know. He might have them tucked up. He has six little legs towards the front of his body, but he doesn't use those to crawl, walk, or dig. They actually have hairs on the back of their body that help them walk and crawl and dig. So these guys, when you see them out in the wild, 
they actually look like they're walking on their backs, which is so cool. And they use their front feet to just shovel food into their mouth. So these beetles are different than the other ones that we just saw. These guys are herbivores. So they're eating plant material, they're eating dirt and soil, um, kind of uh, roots on plants and um, rotting wood as well. So I know we have a lot of other babies to see, so I'm gonna turn it over and see if anybody has questions about some of our breeding we do here at the museum or about beetle larvae in general. Yes, absolutely, we do have some questions. Um, to start, Cedric H8 asked, why is it called a grub? That is such a wonderful question. I have no idea why it's called a grub. Um, it's kind of like how we call a uh, butterfly larva, we call them caterpillars. It's just like what scientists decided to name the stage. So similar to the first baby that we saw, which was our water tiger, it's also a larva. It's that first stage or that second stage in their, in their life cycle. And that's just what scientists decide to call them. Except water tigers, they got their name because they are vicious underwater predators. Great. And speaking of the water tiger, Lucy and Charlotte in fifth and third grade want to know how big they get. Such a great question. So water tigers and sun beetles are one of my personal favorite animals. I love them. So those guys molt three times or they molt twice. So they go through three different stages and each time they get a little bit bigger. So by the time that they are in their final stage, they've molted twice. They are probably about half the size of my pinky. So they get pretty big. Um, so this guy that you saw is the smallest that it will ever be. Great, let's see, Ishan and Gianna and someone else wanna know if any of these animals have names yet. What a wonderful question. So none of these guys have names yet. Um, when they're still in this, in this stage, they all look really, really similar. Once they become adults, we're able to see different uh, patterns on their bodies and able to kind of start to tell the difference between them. But at this stage, they all pretty much look exactly the same. Um, uh, we actually have a couple more grubs. And if Liz showed you those that are in the container right next to her, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference except some are a little bit bigger and some are a little bit smaller. Um, great, let's see. Cedric H8 wants to know how uh, they got the name diving beetle. <gasps> Wonderful question. So the adult that, so the adults are these little beetles that are black and yellow. They're super cute. We did have them in a previous video. So if you log on to our MOS at home, you can look up the previous video that they were in. I think that was our aquatics part one. Um, but they are these little beetles that look like little turtles or scuba divers, and they dive down, um, hang out underwater, and go back up to the surface to get a little air that they trap under their wings, um, and that's how they breathe underwater. So they're called diving beetles because they look like little scuba divers that go down underwater um, and live their lives down there. Great question. Yes, definitely. Um, Elizabeth asks, why do they pupate? Such a good question. So these guys pupate so they can turn into their adult stage. This is how they have evolved over thousands and thousands, you know, of years, millions of years, um, is that this is their life stage. Just how we, we don't pupate. We, you know, we get bigger and bigger and bigger and we don't notice, but our skin is kind of slowly, you know, shedding off of us. With these guys, they do one big shed to get bigger. Um, and so they, they pupate, that's just what they, they're natu they naturally do. But it is really cool. We do have a video on our Sparks of Science um, that also shows the complete stage where I go through the grub. I actually show the pupa and I show you what's inside of the pupa, which is really cool. Cause it looks like, it looks like the beetle, but they're usually yellow and clear, but you can see all the features. So it almost looks like an alien. It's really, really cool. Great. Uh, so Poppy H7 wants to know why this grub is so big. That's a great question. This grub is so big because it makes a big beetle. So the bigger the beetle, the bigger the grub. So if you guys have ever heard of Hercules beetles, they're giant beetles. The grub is so big, it won't even, it wouldn't fit in my hand. I have, a, I kind of have small hands though, but the grubs are so big, they can fully fit in your entire hand. So the size of the beetle, tends to determine or the to the size of the grub. So this grub that we're looking at is actually uh, getting close to making its pupa cell. 
So the one way that I can tell is their coloring changes a little bit and their body becomes really firm. So uh, when you're holding a grub, it kind of feels like a squishy bag of goo. So when you squeeze it, it's kind of like everything inside just kind of moves to a different place than where you are. So when they're getting ready, they kind of become very firm. So when you press down on them, they don't give way so much. Great question. Awesome. Well, we still have some more questions about these, but we have some other animals that I would love to get to. So I am going to put up a slide while we get ready for our other animals. Um, so here's our slide of the water tigers, which was that first animal we saw really quickly. Um, you can see it a little bit more close up here. So feel free to take a screenshot of this or a picture of it to learn a little bit more about the water tigers um, or the sunburst diving beetle. And then our second animal uh, was the Derby's flower beetle right here. So there's a nice close up picture of that. Uh, feel free again, to take a screenshot or picture. Um, to learn a little bit more about these. And now I think, are we ready for our next animal? We are ready for our next baby animal. Really, I should say baby animals. We actually have four within the, ne the next group. I couldn't choose just one, so I brought all four of the babies. So these are snakes, baby snakes. In fact, they are properly known as red rat snakes, more commonly called corn snakes. And we do have four babies that hatched here at the museum. So the first one actually hatched on April 28th and the last one, number four, hatched on May 3rd. That's pretty common in reptiles for there to be a range in those hatch dates in those babies. Now, red rat snakes or corn snakes are native to the United States. Now, Corey is going to cycle through so you guys get a chance to see all four of them while I'm talking. Now, they don't live in New England. They're not native to this area, but you can find them in eastern United States, up as far north as about New Jersey. So they're not quite in New England, um, but they are definitely U.S. snakes. Now they get the name corn snake. It is said that the underside or underbelly of some of these snakes looks kind of like Indian corn or maize. Now you're not really gonna notice it too much on these individuals, but it is how they got that name and the name just kind of stuck over the years. Now corn snakes are non-venomous constrictors. So just like boas and pythons, they do squeeze their prey in order to kill, even when they are this tiny. Now these corn snakes have already doubled in size from when they first hatched and they're gonna continue to get larger. Corn snakes at full size can get about five feet in length. Now snakes technically grow throughout their entire lifetime, but the growth definitely slows as they get older. So their most growth, they're gonna grow the most in their first eight years of life. Typically around seven or eight years is when a snake reaches maturity. So these guys have already doubled and they're going to continue to grow a lot in the next several years. Now, you guys have probably noticed, as Corey has been showing you all the different baby snakes, they don't all look the same. They actually have different colors and different patterns. Now, this is something kind of interesting about corn snakes. So corn snakes in the wild kind of look more uh, like you'd picture, remember I said their name was red rat snake, they kind of look more red in appearance. They have lots of kind of blotches on their bodies. They're red, brown, tan, orange. Uh, they definitely live up to that red rat snake name. Corn snakes are really common in the pet trade. So actually what people do is they actually breed them for different color morphs. So they try to kind of play with the genetics and come up with different colors. So the parents of these four corn snakes don't look like that wild type, that reddish brown that I described to you. The mother of these corn snakes, I actually introduced several weeks ago. Those of you that follow our shows a lot probably remember meeting her. She's mostly orange, kind of some brighter orange, some kind of faded orange. The father actually looks nothing like that. He doesn't have any red, orange, or brown at all. He is black and gray. So I guess when you put those two snakes together, you came up with what I think are these beautiful four baby snakes that we have now. Uh, now I'm sure this already brought up lots of questions, Sarah. So why don't I turn it over to you guys? Yes, for sure. So Lucy and Charlotte asked, how do they slither? 
So snakes have a couple different movement patterns that they use. Uh, one of the things they do, which actually you're seeing a little bit on Corey's fingers right now, is they actually will push their wide belly scales against a surface. It kind of works like a tire tread to kind of help them move against something that might be a little smooth to give them a little bit of traction. Um, they also have something that is called a side winding motion um, that a lot of them will do. A lot of desert snake use that one. Um, so there are a couple other different kinds of movement. Um, snakes in general are extremely muscular animals. It is pretty amazing that they can move the way that they do without any limbs, um, but they are able to do it. So speaking of which, um, of the movement, we have a question, can they climb? Yeah, so these snakes aren't usually arboreal, so they don't spend a ton of time up in trees, but all snakes are able to climb somewhat. So there certainly are snakes that are better uh, adapted for climbing up those trees. Um, but if you kind of think of it, the snake is sort of climbing Corey's hands right now. Um, so they are able to climb, but they do spend most of the time on the ground in the wild. This view is very cute of the snake. Ms. Um, Lanigan's K1 class wants to know, uh, do these snakes tend to bite? So we always say working with animals, anything with a mouth can bite, um, but snakes tend to not bite unless they have a really good reason. Um, snakes don't just go around and bite because they think it's fun. Um, in the wild, if you approach a snake, it's probably going to be pretty afraid and it's gonna try to get away. Um, but if it gets threatened, if it feels scared, it definitely might bite. Um, these corn snakes, since they hatched here at the museum, We've been handling them since they were very, very young. So they're actually really pretty good about it and pretty used to being handled. So we don't anticipate these snakes ever biting, um, but they definitely could if something suddenly scared them. Um, but they have never bitten anybody uh, since they have been uh, alive in uh, late April, early May. So they are really well behaved. Uh, Chad, Deye, and Ishan asked, what are their names? They actually do not have names yet. Um, stay tuned, because hopefully we'll come up with some good names for them soon. Um, but since they are still pretty young babies, uh, we haven't come up with four good names for them yet. Uh, we might name them after scientists. We're not entirely sure yet. Um, but as of now, they are unnamed, but stay tuned. Uh, Cedric, age eight, wants to know, why are they called rat snakes? So red rat snakes, there's also some other kinds of rat snakes. There are black rat snakes, gray rat snakes, yellow rat snakes. Um, they do tend to eat rodents. Uh, now, obviously a snake this tiny is not going to be eating a rat. Um, snakes can eat things bigger than their head, um, but a rat would be way, way too big for this snake to ever get at this size. Um, but I guess the name just kind of stuck as a common name uh, since a lot of these snakes tend to hunt rodents in general. Um, but I can't really uh, tell you why the first person to decide to call them rat snakes decided to do that, um, but they do tend to eat rodents. Allison, age 10, wants to know when they molt, does their pattern change? Oh, that's interesting. So sometimes the coloration might change a little bit as a snake grows up. Um, two of the snakes that you saw actually were darker, kind of more black when they first hatched. And as they've shed, they've kind of turned more, uh, almost more orangey red. Um, it won't be a drastic change, but you might see just some slight, uh, just changes in shading. Uh, another thing that sometimes will happen, some kinds of snakes will dull as they grow, as they shed, uh, they will kind of dull in color. Great, okay, I think we have one more question about this animal. Um, well, first of all, Vivian has some great suggestions for names, all lightning themed, lightning, Ooh. thunder, strike. Um, a couple people are asking if they can swim. So they're not aquatic snakes. You're not gonna find them swimming through really deep lakes or ponds. If they did come across a stream, something shallow, um, they certainly could move their way through it. Um, so they are capable of swimming, but they're not aquatic by nature. You're not gonna find them living in water. Awesome. All right. Well, we have one more animal to get to, and I would love to get to that. So I'm going to put up some facts about the red rat snake or the corn snake. 
Um, so feel free to take a picture of this again. Uh, you can learn a little bit more about it and then we'll be ready for our very last animal today. I think we are just about ready. So hopefully this one is worth the wait. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a mammal. Uh, so for all of you out there who like uh, cute and fuzzy things, uh, this is definitely gonna be the animal for you. Um, so this animal, this baby is our screaming hairy armadillo. I know that's a pretty silly name. Uh, we'll break it down in just a couple moments. Now, this baby armadillo was actually born on July 4th. So he was an Independence Day baby. Um, so even though he's only a couple months old, he is completely full grown. Uh, and to tell you a little secret, he is actually currently bigger than his mother. And he often has to be separated from her during feeding times because he likes to eat a lot and often steals food from her these days. Um, but again, even at just a few months old, he is completely full grown. Now that name, Screaming Hairy Armadillo. A lot of times people don't think it's a serious name, but that is the technical name for this animal. So let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, armadillos. I'm guessing most of you have heard of armadillos before. Maybe some of you have been lucky enough to see an armadillo before. Armadillo literally means little armored one, and they are covered in bony plates. It's very unique for a mammal to have this protective covering on their bodies. So armadillos are pretty distinct in that they have that bony plate covering. Now, there are lots of different kinds of armadillos. There's actually about 20 different species. Most are native to Central and South America. We do have one US armadillo. It's called the nine-banded armadillo. Those of you that like to spend time in some of the Southern states, Florida, Texas, maybe you've seen a nine-banded armadillo before. Now, the screaming hairy armadillos are native to parts of South America. So places like Argentina, Paraguay are where you will commonly find uh, these animals. Uh, he is now currently hiding a little bit in there, making Corey work pretty hard uh, to try to get him up on camera. So I explained the armadillo part of the name a little bit. Now let's get to the hairy. Actually, you guys are getting a good glimpse right now at the hair on this armadillo. Armadillos are mammals, just like we are. So they are covered in hair or fur, just like all mammals. But I guess the hairy armadillos are named because they're a little hairier than some of the other ones. So that explains the hairy part of the name. Now let's get to the screaming part of the name. You guys probably noticed that this armadillo is not screaming right now because you can't hear him, but they do scream when they feel threatened. So maybe if a predator grabs onto them, something really startles them, they do let out a loud, shrill scream. Now I've heard some people compare it to a squealing pig. I've heard some compare it to a screaming toddler. Um, it is very loud. It is very surprising to come out of an animal of this size. Now the hope is if they let out that scary noise, whatever was bothering them hopefully will be startled enough that they drop them and maybe go away. So it actually does work as a defense. Now our armadillo is getting pretty used to being around us. I know he's only a couple months old, but chances are he won't scream while he's in this case. So if you are very interested in hearing what a screaming hairy armadillo sounds like, I recommend looking it up on YouTube. Um, you will find some pretty funny sound files. Uh, I know they're stressed out when they do it, but it is a pretty amusing noise that they make. Uh, now, I'm sure this has brought up lots of questions, so why don't I turn it over for some of those? Yes, absolutely. All right, Jack wants to know how fast can it move? They can move pretty quickly. They're really good at digging very quickly. So they tend to not just try to run really fast across the ground. What they would do is run really fast and then dig underground really, really quickly. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever clocked their mileage. If we were running a race, like if you were running a race against the armadillo just across the ground, you probably could win in that race, but getting underground really, really quickly, they certainly can be very fast. Uh, Miss Lanigan's K1 class wants to know what do these armadillos feel like? Are they spiky? 
That's very interesting. I remember being really surprised the first time I touched an armadillo. I had no idea what it was going to feel like. And they don't feel spiky. Um, if you see all those hairs, you're getting a really good glimpse of them right now. They almost feel kind of like bristly. So they're not as soft as our hairs or like a cat's fur. It almost feels a little bit bristly. Um, but then those bony plates, uh, they almost feel like kind of a slightly harder version of like your fingernail. Um, actually covering those bony plates is keratin which is the same material that makes up our fingernails. So a little bit rougher than your fingernail, but kind of similar to that. I guess that's the best way I can describe it. So speaking about how they feel, Haley wants to know why do they have hair on them? So it is a characteristic of mammals to be covered in hair or fur. These particular armadillos, since they do spend a lot of time underground and burrowing, they actually can use those hairs as a, a sensory device. So they can kind of feel around and feel their way underground. Um, maybe when they can't see as well, because it's a little bit darker under the dirt. Um, so they really can use those hairs more as sensory things. Great. Okay. Cedric, age eight, and Vivian, age nine, want to know what is his name? His name is Booth. Um, which is a character from uh, Dora the Explorer. Uh, his mother's name is Dora and his father's name is Diego. So that just seemed like the perfect name for this baby when he was born. Uh, Cam, age five, wants to know what he's being fed right now. I know, Corey finally got him to unveil himself uh, after he went into hiding for a few minutes by offering him some food. Um, so what you saw him eating were some meal worms. Um, so they're actually larvae of beetles as well. So we've kind of come full circle in our show today. Um, they are larvae of a different beetle than the, one, uh, the ones you guys saw earlier. Um, they do eat a lot of insects. They might even eat dead animals in the wild that they find. They'll eat some vegetation as well. Um, so they are technically omnivores, although they prefer eating insects. That's gonna be their favorite thing. Allison, age 10, wants to know if they have other defenses than their scream in their shells. And Elizabeth wants to know, does he go into a ball when he's really scared? Wow, those are all really good questions. So their main defense is, again, they have that protective shell. Uh, then their next defense is gonna be that digging, that burrowing really, really quickly. The scream would be more the last thing if something grabs onto them. That's gonna be when the scream happens. Now, they do curl up slightly. These bands, six of their bands are actually movable. Um, so they will curl up a little bit into a ball, but they can't curl completely into a ball. Um, only one kind of armadillo can curl up completely into a ball and be completely protected, and that is called the three-banded armadillo. Great. Okay. And for our last question, we're having a lot of questions about what armadillos are related to. So for example, Sean wants to know if they're a type of rat. Devin from third grade class in Hull wants to know are they related to turtles. Someone else asked if they're related to snakes. So I know you've mentioned it's a mammal, but maybe we could talk a little bit more about uh, about what it's related to. <laughs> of course. Um, so being a mammal, they're not very closely related to turtles or snakes. A lot of times people think they kind of look like a turtle because they have sort of their own version of a shell, kind of like a turtle. Um, so they're kind of unique in the mammal category. Um, they're only close relatives are some other kind of unusual mammals. They are related to anteaters and sloths. Uh, so they're all kind of unique mammals uh, and they are grouped together. Um, so they're definitely more related to us since we're mammals, but it is pretty distantly related. Those sloths and anteaters are gonna be their closest living relatives. Awesome, well, thank you so much. We are out of time for today. So everyone say goodbye to our educator and to our armadillo. Bye guys. Right. I am going to put up a quick uh, fact sheet about boots are screaming hairy armadillo. Feel free to take a screenshot of this or a picture of all of this information. So thank you so much for being amazing scientists today. There are so many questions that uh, we unfortunately didn't get to, um, but you can feel free to tune, tune into all of our virtual offerings at mos.org slash mos at home. Uh, we will be doing live animals again next week, but it will be on Thursday. So keep an eye out for that. If you enjoyed today's program, you can support the museum by visiting engage.mos.org slash 
welcome. So again, thank you so much. Have a great weekend.